So I just came back from one of those van life conventions where companies go out and showcase their latest and greatest off-road van builds. And the first thing I discovered is A, there's really one or two choices here in the US, the Sprinter and the Transit, and maybe the Promaster if you want to get a little crazy, and B, they are ridiculously expensive, most of them $150,000 to $200,000. But if you get a little creative, there are some awesome ways to experience some truly incredible vans for a tiny amount of money in a small, drivable, fuel-efficient, reliable package that doesn't break the bank. So in this video, we've got two very unusual Japanese legally imported vans, and we're going to talk through the pros and the cons of each, and we're going to do just a little bit of off-roading. So this is something you guys have probably never seen, and I've got Larry. Come on over, buddy. Hi. It's great to see you. This is Larry's van, and you said this is called a K-Van? Yes. So this is a Japanese K-Van, which is a class of car that um, is regulated by the size and width and then the horsepower and engine size. So they can only be 660 cc. Okay. So is this a pretty common sight in Japan? The delivery versions are. They're, uh, you know, they're like chalk and cheese. They're everywhere. But um, this is a passenger version. It's not as common. Okay. But, uh, you know, they're still, they're still quite common compared to the U.S. So a uh, very, very tiny van. Uh, small displacement, but is this four-wheel drive? It is. It's four-wheel drive and it's supercharged. So I get a whopping 55 horsepower. Wow! And talk to me about what drew you to the little sandbar. Um, I just love the way they look and um, I love how efficient they are. You know, even though they're, uh, it's small horsepower, they're, they're pretty snappy, but um, it, <laughs> the story, make a, a short story long. Yeah. Um, I used to ride bicycles. I lived in Japan. I used to ride bicycles, and um, I met my wife. She used to race bicycles. She had a similar car, and I had a similar car. And so we used to meet at the bicycle races the day before all the racers would show up in small vans like this, and we'd sleep in the back, and then the morning we would race. Unreal. And so we kind of became friends, and and so it's kind of it brings a nostalgia back. Okay. Well, let's start with <laughs> the engine because I think it's in the back, right? It is. <laughs> so. Uh, it's a lot of dirt. So it's in the very back, and um, <laughs> kind of it's a it's a kind of a half a boxer. Actually, it's a four cylinder, but and it's completely flat here, and it's 660 cc. And um, actually, if I pull this up, I can show you where the supercharger is. The supercharger is just right over here. Wow. And um, there's a spare tire here. Okay. And then right next to it, this flap is where the one of the radiators are. Unbelievable. And then there's another one up front. And then what's the transmission? It's a five speed. With, but it's really a six speed because there's an extra low gear for okay. um, four wheeling or crawling. Extra low. Okay, so really a six speed. And then 55 horsepower. What's the top speed of this thing? Um, going down with a tailwind, you might get it to 80, <laughs> 85. 80 miles an hour. <laughs> That's when you're screaming at about 7,500 RPM. So th the passenger versions, um, the DS2 was sold. You know, uh, the, the premium model had the, uh, the sunroofs. Um, but also it makes it cool um, is that everything folds completely flat so that's why they were popular when we um when I, we lived in japan and when we raced was that um let me pull this up um the seats could fold completely flat and Whoa. so this folds the other side folds completely flat as well and then um and if you're kind of hanging out you can also rotate the seat yeah no so yeah generally you have it like that oh i gotcha Should be. So this just goes forward like that. What? And then it stops automatically here. It's like, a, so you don't cut somebody's head off if they're, <laughs> <laughs> if they forget to put their head in and then you can close it. And then this opens up too. It does. Yeah. So you can just close this and open this. So it makes it really fun to drive, um, you know, especially like four wheel and stuff. Unreal. So that's, a, that's one of the really cool parts about it. That is so cool. So. so. How many of these vans have you owned? Is this your first one? <laughs> no. Um, I, I, uh, as people in the club say, I have a problem. I've, I, I think I own six. Or I've owned like six or seven. I don't even know. Maybe more. <laughs> so. And what do they typically cost? So obviously this one came from Japan. What do they cost in Japan? And when you bring them over, what are you kind of running total cost? Okay. So I bought this one last year. I paid about 2500 But then I had some work done to it. So I was in at about uh, maybe four. Um, that was for like changing tires and oil and timing belt, yeah, things like that. And then bringing it over, I think it was about two, okay. two twenty five hundred. But then plus you, ha plus you have to pay the taxes. So all in all, I'm in about seventy five hundred to eight, eight grand, I think. Which really so. isn't all that crazy. So yeah, I actually overpaid for this a year ago. <laughs> 
So I could have probably picked it up for maybe a thousand, but that, those times have changed because the prices of them have gone way up. And then talk to me about the legality. I mean, are these legal to register in the U.S.? What about? I mean, how does that work? So they this this is imported under the twenty five year rule. So okay. as long as they're twenty five years or older, they can be imported in, and they have an exemption with the DOT and the EPA. Okay, but it. Uh, every state is different, so some states won't let you register them, and but most states will. So uh, it, it's quite common knowledge in um, Maine that they're blocking people from registering K cars. Very interesting. Um, but uh, Colorado, it's difficult, but it's possible. And air conditioning? Yes, I have it, and it, and it blows cold. It's actually quite nice. Does it really? <laughs> yeah, you lose about 12 horsepower <laughs> of my 55 horsepower I have. I, so it slows you down. So when you, ha you go up a hill, you have to hit the button, and then um, and then. <laughs> You know, turned off the air conditioner to get up the hill. But. And are these all manual transmissions? Or are they all no? Um, actually, the Subarus are eCVTs, um, which, to be honest, are good and bad. They can last ten hundred thousand miles or ten thousand miles. You just don't know. <laughs> they they work great, um, and they have a higher top speed than the manual. But the manual is the one you want, just because um, they last a lot longer. I, I mean, are there people that can fix these? Can you get parts? How does that work? Well, that's the hard part. So um, I kind of learned how to do it. How to, like I had a cappuccino before and I had to learn how to change the timing belt. Something I'd never even thought about doing because I couldn't find anybody to do it. Interesting. So, But they're not hard. These cars are so simple um, that, you know, and because, you know, I think right now we're at 96, it's 25 years old. So as long as the cars are from 1996 or older, you can import them in. And those cars are built really simply. The K car in Japan is a cheap car. So you only get a single stage paint, and they're made super simple. First thing I noticed is A, this car runs beautifully well, and B, the red line is 8,000? Yeah, it has a warning at 75, but supposedly you can bring it all the way up to 85. 85? Yeah, although I've never done that. You're slow getting up to speed, but um, yeah, you're able to keep up. Again, it depends on the tires. Um, when I'm running the 14 inch, the whopping 14 inch tires, then I have no problem keeping up um, with uh, you know, well, Colorado people drive fast, but for the most part, you can keep up 65, 70. And is that just a gearing limit? It is, okay. it's a gearing. It's, that's that's why um, a lot of people like the automatic better, the, e, the ECVT. Okay. But the problem is the reliability of those. Interesting. Um, I actually prefer the ECVT. I, it's much more fun, or not fun to drive, it's just more relaxing to drive because this is not a performance car. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of room. Yes, yeah. Right, like this is not an uncomfortable experience like I might expect it to be. No, not at all. Um, it's it's actually, it's, you know, with my wife and my son, it's it's really fun to take it on trips. Yeah. Um, it's perfect for Garden of the Gods because you're looking up and when the window's open, it's perfect for that. It does have a very small amount of ground clearance. Yes. And that's where those whopping 14 inch tires come in. You get okay. an extra two inches. Wow, that's a lot. So I think total, I, I might have only six inches of ground clearance. I right. don't know what I have. Maybe seven. But I don't know. it's so narrow yeah. that if there is a rock, you just go, you drive you go around. around the rock, right? Yeah. You don't even have to get anywhere near it. Yeah. It's pretty comfortable too. It is, it is. It's not so bad. So this is our off-road testing hill. We call it Tombstone Hill. It's very steep and loose and it's getting rocky and articulated. I can't wait to see the little guy try to drive up Tombstone Hill. You're gonna see, want to stay tuned for this one. So Larry, this has a special low gear, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, it, called EL, extra low. Extra low. So it's just clearance issues, right. mainly. So let's see. That, oh. that does not sound good. Let's go make sure we still have a front end on yeah, it. Yeah, that, that sucks. <laughs> Do I have a front end? It's all bad, right? The clearance? What? It's all bad, right? This way? Alright. I, I, I just, I know I can get up there if I can just find the right line. Thank God. One hell of a bumper. Oh, uh, thank God. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so, this video, just a heads up, was supposed to be Buhanka versus Mitsubishi versus Subaru, but go figure, the Soviet era van is having issues, and the Japanese vans. <laughs> so, so I am in second gear. I have plenty of torque. Okay. Right, and I'm coming up this um, road, 
and it starts sputtering. And I am fuel injected. Right. And I am struggling. I, uh, I'm going a maximum of 23 miles, 26 miles per hour. I need to let it cool off. Uh, look, so I, my coolant temperature uh, gauge doesn't work. My oil uh, pressure does give me something. My voltmeter works, my fuel works, and I just got a check engine light. Look at this up here. So uh, it could be anything like maybe uh, I, I got to some bad fuel. But I did refuel with brand new fuel, by the could way. Be fuel pump? Could be fuel pump, could be fuel filter if there is one. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm bummed. Well, in the battle of the vans, I think we discovered, unfortunately, which one is not going to make it to the trailhead. <laughs> so now we've left it to the Japanese vans to battle out for gold. So we took a look at the little one. Now for the big one. Now Connor has joined me. Good to see you, buddy. Nice to meet you again. Connor did a full video around this vehicle over at TFL Classics, but kind of walk me through what we're looking at, because if I recall, this is one of the more interesting names in the automotive world. This is, once again, a 1991 Mitsubishi Delica Star Wagon. This, as you mentioned, is kind of the most off-road worthy of the Japanese vans. Yeah, of all the Japanese vans, I'd say, just based on the fundamentals of the car, it has the highest ground clearance, has a super short wheelbase, legitimate four-wheel drive, I made a mistake in our last video and I accidentally said it's unibody. It is not. It is body on frame. Okay, and you, you mentioned that this underneath is somewhat similar to a Pajero? It is a Pajero underneath. Okay, gotcha. So it's got real four-wheel drive. It has a low range. Yep. Is that right? Yes, sir. And the cool thing about this one is, let's slide open the door because this has got a ton of room on the inside. Very cool. So, Connor, the seats kind of walk me through what they do because they do some pretty interesting stuff they the seats swivel all the way around they fold perfectly flat you can actually fold all the seats perfectly flat and I, I do when I go camping so I can put a mattress on there so I think one of the big advantages is a Delica and there's just no simple way of saying it but here in America we like our larger vehicles and this does feel like a full-size vehicle yeah it is it is a full size so it, it is nice and big and chunky and it's got some really really cool features now talk to me about what the engine is in this one it is what's known as the 4056, which is a 2.5 liter turbo diesel four cylinder, non intercooled, which is important. <laughs> and it makes very little power 87 horsepower and 148 foot pounds of torque. Okay. So we were talking to Larry. He said this fan will go 70, 75, maybe even 80. What kind of speeds do you hit in the Delica? On a downhill, you can get it to 85, but I would strongly recommend not doing that. It's, okay. <laughs> once you pass 80, this thing turns into a sail ship and a choppy seas. And I'd really recommend keeping it below 70. Like I wouldn't go over 70, especially because at highway speeds, these things are revved out. Real at 70 miles per hour, you're going over 3,000 RPMs, and if you do that for long periods of time, these have a tendency to blow head gaskets. Interesting. So I'd strongly discourage people from doing that. So you're kind of gearing limited there. Yeah. What are they kind of price-wise nowadays in 2021 for something like this? Right now, they've really gone up in value. This one's in damn near mint condition. This one has just over 50,000 miles on it, and honestly, I, it's, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I could probably get 25 minimum for this. Wow, okay. So, more expensive than the little K-Vans, but still relative to like a Promaster or a built-out Sprinter, very, very affordable. Have you been able to find parts? I mean, what is that experience like? Um, most parts you're going to get overseas. Like, I get my oil filters from Dubai. They make Fram oil filters for these in America, but if you put a Fram oil filter in your car, you should get your keys taken away. <laughs> so I get mine from Dubai and they cost like $50 for an oil filter, which gotcha. is a bit insane. And pretty much, I haven't had to do much maintenance to this apart from changing the brake hoses, which I got from the UK. But I've looked at the parts and you're going to struggle finding parts in the US. You just are. You know, it's an interesting thing that you said earlier because um, I've never seen a K-Van personally in the States. I've seen a couple of Delicas. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there's at least a small community here. Yeah, these have started to become more popular. It's surprising every now, at gas, every now and then at gas stations, people come and be like, is this a Delica? I'm like, yes, yes it is. What drew you to the Delica? The strangeness. Okay. Well, really, I wanted a van to go camping in because I love camping. I hike a lot of 14ers and I like, especially out here, Colorado, we have Utah, Arizona nearby. There's so much cool nature that we can just go hang out in. And 
I have a Jeep Cherokee, yep. which is nice, but I cannot sleep in it. And I got tired of setting up tents and getting rained on and being cold. I saw some with a Vanagon once at a campsite and I got super jealous. So I started looking at Vanagons for sale, but they were ridiculously expensive, like 30 grand for just a standard rear wheel drive one, 200,000 miles, rusted to hell. And I'm like, I can't do that, it's just not worth it. So I started looking around and I heard of this thing called a Delica and I saw it, I fell in love immediately. I'm like, I have to have one. So I saved up for a couple years and found this one at the right time and I purchased it. So you, I think, paid 17 for this, you're saying? I paid 17, 250. And how does it how does it perform when you get it out into the dirt? Is it, is, are you pretty pleased with it? It does quite well. It does quite well. I mean, it's not, I'm not gonna be taking it over Hell's Revenge, you know? <laughs> I'm not that kind of guy. It won't, it just won't do it, but it'll get me away from all the other campsites. I can get away from all the schmucks in their normal cars. Yep. And uh, get out to, bouncing around like a seesaw here. <laughs> It's, it's a weird sensation, right, because you do get kind of a lot of like forward and back movement. Oh yeah, you go up and down, up and down, and it's just, cause yeah, you're just right perched on the front of the car. Oh. Downside to that, I mean, <laughs> the upside is you have incredible visibility everywhere. The downside is if you crash, I am the I am the crumple zone. Do you think that you'll be able to climb this hill? Easy. Easy, okay. Easy. So, based on the Pajero, which is a highly capable vehicle, Yep. And what are some of the pros and the cons of the Delica? Pros and I mean, biggest pros is just the drivetrain itself. Okay. Solid rear axle, four wheel low. Biggest con I would say is the torsion bar front suspension. This thing picks wheels up. It does not flex whatsoever. Okay, interesting. But this is, shouldn't be too much difficulty. Throw her in four low. It's like riding a Disney roller coaster. It's like being on a seesaw because you're in, pretty much on the top of the front wheels and we're in front of the engine. This is an insane feeling. Look at it go though. Oh, it's not as even broken a sweat. Oh, dude, this like is I said, a this monster. Is the, the limited slip rear diff makes a massive advantage because I can just crawl over things. I don't have to mash the throttle to get momentum, which is really nice. And you've got pretty good torque. Oh yeah, lots of low on torque. Once I throw it in four low, I'd never have any issues with power. So I took a Sprinter 4x4 up here on that same hill. Mm -hmm. This just rocked it compared to the Sprinter. Oh. The Sprinter did not have enough torque. The Sprinters are so range. big and they have such a long wheelbase. Yep. So we'll have to get Andre back out here. Yeah, we have to do a rematch because the Subaru, as cool as it is, is not an off-roader. It's issue. not an off-roader. No, it was, so it was a bit of a squash match, these two. We'll get the Lennon. You know, we'll get the Lennon bread box back out here and, and see how that compares eventually once Andre gets it up and running. But can't wait. First thing I'm gonna say is that this is a much more refined experience than that old Soviet box. I mean you've got a real trunk or a real hood, even though I'm sitting on it. I I can't even hear the engine. Yeah. It's that quiet. Really, really cool. It's quite nice. Compared to my Jeep XJ, it's like a luxury vehicle. Dude, thank you. This has been a real treat. Yep. Guys, check out TFL Off-Road. We'll have more of these cool off-road vans. Let me know what you think. I think a lot of you are going to like this. And big thank you for coming out here, man. Well, thanks for having me.